Okay, here's the little Song of Songs lecture. Uh, first off, we note that this particular piece of writing has no fixed title. It's known in various versions of the Bible that I know by three different titles. Uh, it's called Song of Solomon in some versions because it was believed earlier that it was written by King Solomon. It's called Canticles, meaning it's the Latin word for songs in other versions. Uh, in our version it's called Song of Songs. Uh, I expect it has other names in other versions as well. Um, but I like Song of Songs because that tells us about how the thing is organized. It's a bunch of little songs all gathered together in one big song. Uh, and that sort of uh, indicates an allegorical interpretation. We'll talk about allegory another time. Um, but this is the, uh, the only piece like it in the entire Bible in terms of its complexity and its literary depth. Um, and it's dependent entirely upon the, the literary use of what is called hyperbole, H-Y-P-E-R-B-O-L-E, -E, which is exaggeration for effect uh, or for some purpose, deliberate uh, blowing things out of proportion for some reason uh, that is uh, known perhaps only to the poet. And again, the, the poet assumes that the audience will recognize that it's hyperbolic, the use of hyperbole, and will respond accordingly. Uh, it's one of the oldest techniques. It's, it's been around forever, uh, and poets use it. Poets, in fact, I think are kind of given to hyperbole. Uh, but in the 16th and 17th centuries, poets also responded against this excessive use of hyperbole because any kind of exaggeration can get out of hand fairly quickly and so Shakespeare writes this little sonnet called My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun which he's specifically criticizing uh, this uh, overly flowery use of hyperbole. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, and it also is prevalent in what is called a conceit in, in uh, the so-called metaphysical poets of the 16th century. Now conceit doesn't mean stuck up like I'm conceited because I think I'm better than you are. But the root of, of our use of that word in that way does come from this concept of conceit. It really means conception uh, and it means that there's hidden knowledge in the thing. The real meaning is very, very deeply hidden uh, deliberately by the poet for reasons that, you know, there could be a half a dozen reasons. Um, so the idea of me being conceited and me thinking I'm better than you are, for instance, doesn't really mean the same thing, but it comes from the idea that I know something you don't know because you haven't read the poem or you haven't participated. You haven't uh, dug deep enough into the poem to find the hidden meaning. So the word conceited, which is a bad word uh, in our own time, or a, a, at least a pejorative word in our own time, it comes from this idea of there being hidden knowledge that <clears throat> only a skilled reader can mine out. So this piece, whatever it means, and it means nobody really knows what it means, um, but is dependent upon the technique of conceit and hyperbole, meaning the meaning is way, way, way down somewhere, and you have to dig for it, and there are probably a dozen meanings that one could find, and the original intention of the poet is not all that important, uh, but rather finding one's own meaning uh, is what becomes important. Um, Just a quick word about uh, Israelite history. We haven't talked a lot about it, and we're not going to, uh, except as the literature uh, relates to it. But you're going to start seeing this word pre-exilic and post-exilic. What that refers to is a verifiable fixed point in history, the year 587 BCE, before the Common Era, when the so-called Solomon's Temple, or the First Temple, was destroyed 
and the Israelites were exiled into Babylon. That's the exile, the first mm -hmm. destruction of the first temple. And that period, up until 587, from the sort of settling in Jerusalem, which can't be really fixed in time, the growth of Jerusalem as a city uh, can't be fixed in time, but this year 587 is pretty accurately fixed because there are references to it in other sources other than just the biblical material. So we can say, yeah, this, this first temple in Jerusalem was in fact destroyed in 587. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's called the first temple period. And then they come back and they rebuild the temple after a period of 50 or 60 years. And then the second temple is destroyed in 70 of the common era during the, the sort of upheavals that immediately followed the beginning of, beginning of the, the Christian era. And so uh, that's the second temple period. Anyway, uh, this is uh, Suggs, and I think rightly so, says this uh, around the exile post-exile, pre-exile, anyway, he's speaking of that fixed point in time, 587 BCE. That's not terribly important, uh, I think, to our purposes, which is why I haven't really focused on it. We will do a short unit on, on uh, the history. Okay, uh, so a good paper topic would be to compare this use of hyperbole here, uh, to, you know, coming forward, it, it sort of flowered in the time of Shakespeare and others. It's always been around, but it sort of flowered uh, in the time of Shakespeare and John Donne. So you might uh, compare or you might just talk about the technique of hyperbole. Um, I, wouldn't try, I wouldn't try to assign meaning to this because uh, hyperbole and allegory, which is another technique we'll talk about later, they they depend so much on the individual personality that when I come out with um, my understanding of, of a highly hyperbolic poem like this or a highly symbolic poem, it's, it's my personal understanding probably doesn't mean a lot to anybody else. Um, for instance, uh, Christian writers take this to, to be a preview or a type TYP, that's a specific uh, literary term, of the relationship between Jesus and the Christian church. Well, for one thing, that can't possibly have been the intention of the original writer, since there was no Christian church when this was written. Uh, and so the Christian writers have taken this, that's their interpretation. And that's fine, that's their interpretation. Um, but my, I'm... I'm advising against trying to ascribe fixed external meaning to this piece because it can't be done and all that's going to do is bog you down and, and it, it's basically a dead end street so I advise against trying to do that if you write on this piece and I hope some of you will write on it as a type of hyperbolic poem in which uh, the meaning is is obscure but you can talk about techniques, you can compare the techniques, and you can, um, you know, write about the technique itself and the specific examples used here, and then you could bring in comparing and contrasting examples from other poetry of this material. Uh, in the little handout, I've given you an optional link, and you can look at this or not if you want, but uh, there's a, a beautiful musical setting, to my mind, beautiful musical setting of the passage that begins on page... 694, uh, by William Billings, who was one of the first major American-born composers. Um, and it's just, it's a lovely setting of uh, I Am the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valley. Um, Billings uses the 1611 version, so if you want to follow along with uh, the actual words, you'll have to find the 1611 version, and I, I've told you how to do it there. You won't find it word for word in your uh, in your copy in Suggs because they've done a different approach to the translation. Um, and finally, just I'll tell you what I think this means because of the 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 way the 
the, the actual meaning is hidden so deeply below that one has to dig, there may have been some political reason for hiding the meaning. My personal take on this poem is that it's a love poem between uh, King David and his friend Jonathan, uh, and because those relationships were kind of frowned on in this culture, it had to be very, very deeply symbolic and the, the meaning hidden uh, very deeply down. That's my personal take. You can accept it or not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but that's what I happen to think. Um, okay, so that's the end of this Song of Songs, Song of Solomon's Canticle Lecture. Uh, we have one more to do, and, and I may not try to do that one today because it's somewhat more complicated, and that is the book of Job, which I'm taking as a, uh, uh, as a, a liturgical drama uh, for, again, looking at the way the thing is shaped and the way it's formed by the writer. It looks like a play to me and many other uh, literary scholars. So I may or may not get to that today. Uh, but I want to get this one up for you. Okay, hope you're having a great early week, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.